President Biden is continuing to voice his support for Ukraine, continue to ask for more money to support the efforts in Ukraine. And really, at this point, you're wondering, like, what more could we do? What more should we do? Let's talk this over with Andrew Donaldson, who's managing editor of Ordinary Times and the host of Heard Tell, a daily multi-platform program that discusses culture and politics. Andrew, thanks uh, and welcome to Iowa Radio. Good morning. Yeah, good to be back with you again. Appreciate the time. It, it's really interesting, Andrew, because I notice, I'm sure you notice this too, you know, a lot of the stories about Ukraine is, okay, we need more money, we need more money, we need more money, but really... Aren't we at this point kind of, you know, limited in what we can do? And I say that because I'm always asking guests on this show, hey, how do we do this without igniting World War III? And that's always the issue, isn't it, when we're talking about what we can do in regard to Ukraine? Yeah, pretty much what we are doing is is the way you keep it. Th- look, the, there's no good options in Ukraine, but the best of the bad options is to let Ukraine do their own fighting and then us support them up to a certain point that they have the tools to stay in the fight and take the fight to the Russians. That keeps the Russians busy from doing other bad things in other places. That lets them take care of their own stuff without putting our own troops in harm's way. This is pretty much what we ought to be doing, and it's important to point out here. They've been fighting in these separatist regions, the Donbass region, since 2014. This war has been going on for a long time, and America has been supporting them. We've had a long debate over how much we should support Ukraine with military aid to fight the Russians and these separatist group. Remember, we had that former President Trump got sideways on that over a call over that. If you remember, that was a call over Ukrainian aid. So anyway, this is something we've been debating for eight or nine years now. And this war is going to go on for a long time. We're probably going to be debating it for quite a long time more. The answer is probably this is about what we ought to be doing, giving them. We've got 60 days of data on what works. Give them the small arms. Give them the anti-tank weapons. Give them the stuff we know that works. Maybe excuse some of the other stuff and then just kind of keep what we're doing because this is how it's going to contain and let them fight their own battle here. I tell you, this is what brings the issue home for me, Andrew. Just a few weeks ago, there was a lot of talk about the NATO establishing a no-fly zone over Ukraine, and my daughter is married to a Marine, and she said to me, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't, because, you know, she's like everybody else. It's what, uh, where do you cross the line? When do you do the wrong thing that pulls us into a direct conflict with Russia. Those are the things you got to be careful about, even as some Americans call for them, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. The, the thing about the no-fly zone is anytime somebody brings that up, the first question you ask them are, are you prepared to shoot down a Russian aircraft or probably a bunch of them because they're going to come heavy right into it? Because that's what a no-fly zone is. That's what we've had in Iraq. That's what we had in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's what you do. You put your guys in the air and say, you're not flying here. And the first person that comes in there, you shoot them down. We're not going to do that with Russia because that would be an act of war. That would be a massive escalation. That would be a justified escalation on their part to get more uh, involved with us. So, no, we're not going to do that because that's the real question you ask. No fly zone sounds great in a vacuum, sounds great in a soundbite. Are you prepared to shoot down a Russian aircraft the first time they violate it? Because if you're not, it's not a no-fly zone. And if you're not, you're just escalating with no plan. And that's when things really get sideways. So we are wisely not doing that here. I agree with you, Andrew. Now, the other talk, of course, is uh, Putin continuing to hint that maybe he'd go nuclear. Now, sometimes when we talk about that, we talk about him attacking the U.S. with nuclear. But there is some buzz now in the media, and, and Andrew is the managing editor of Ordinary Times. There's buzz that if Putin gets more frustrated with how things are going in Ukraine, he'd go to that in Ukraine. What do you think about that talk? Yeah, the concern is everybody in their mental image, when they hear nuclear weapon, they're thinking Hiroshima, where a large bomb takes out a whole city. They also have tactical nuclear weapons. So something like, and God forbid this happens, I'm just using as an example, the steel factory in Mariupol, where they got these guys holed up, what if they would use a tactical uh, small nuclear weapon and just obliterate that pocket of resistance. That's the kind of thing people are scared of him doing. It's not so much widespread destruction. It's just an escalation where he proves he could do it. He's already proven he doesn't care about Ukrainian lives. He doesn't care about humanity. He doesn't care about killing people. Is there enough people around him to be like, you cannot do this because then the world really would come after us? I sure hope so. But with Putin, everything's off the table. It's scary because this guy really does have nuclear weapons and he really doesn't have any regard for human life, whatever. If this keeps going bad for him, it's a concern. Uh, but all we can really do right now is hope because we don't really have a good option to prevent it at this point. Andrew, I can see texts from our listeners as you and I are talking. And one listener says, Jeff, at what point 
do we say we cannot afford this? I'm very empathetic toward the situation in Ukraine, but we're broke. And I'm worried this is just another excuse to grab tax dollars, raise taxes. It's time for other nations to step up. And there are several texts along those lines, Andrew. Are other nations doing enough? Are we doing too much? Well, let's praise the nations that are doing a lot. Poland has been out in front on this. They're carrying the burden. They, of course, share the burden, so they got a big interest in doing it. They've done a fantastic job. Uh, our friends in the U.K. have really stepped up. You have countries like Germany that are still trying to kind of play this thing both sides down the middle. They're the ones that really need to step up and get involved here. Uh, some other European countries, that's fair criticism, but we could also keep things in perspective. This is a life and death struggle. Thirty billion dollars, like the president's talking about, adding to the budget here. Sixteen billion of that's going to the Pentagon for weapons. The rest is humanitarian aid. That's what three and a half weeks of COVID stimulus. So a little bit of perspective here. We we need to get our financial house in order. I agree. When it's a life and death situation, maybe we put that off for some of the other fraud, waste, and abuse that is rampant in the other parts of our government. I agree with them. I think there's a way to hash that out. It's something we should always keep mindful. But again, life and death situation, maybe put that on the front burner and then get our fiscal house in order in other ways where we know there's a lot of waste. We know there's a lot, a lot of that stimulus money I just mentioned. They can't even account for a lot yeah. of that. There's plenty of other ways we can do it and trim down and still do things we need to do, like stand up to evil in the world and help our allies who are in the fight. He's the managing editor of Ordinary Times and the host of Heard Tell, a daily multi-platform program discussing culture and politics. Great perspective from Andrew Donaldson this morning. Andrew, thanks very much for joining me. Of course.